Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. I hope you're good. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, container gardening, and I'll ask the girls to uh, pull that presentation up, and we'll get started. <clears throat> Here we are, El Paso Master Gardener Association, like we didn't know what that is, right? The title today of my presentation, <clears throat> in the past I've done uh, Down to Earth with Container Gardening, but because I am already talking to a bunch of experts as master gardeners. I just want to try and give you some more tips and tricks for successful gardening. So have you ever felt like this? You know, with determination, some manual labor, <clears throat> and a vision for your landscape, you can go from famine and frustration to feast and fulfillment. Now, many of the pictures that I'm going to share with you here at the first of the meeting are pictures from my own yard, uh, pictures from friend yard. Many of you remember Jim Hastings. This picture right here uh, is of uh, Jim's uh, cactus garden. And uh, as you can see, there's many things in the ground as well as in containers. This is one of my auxiliary flower beds, if you will. I call this Frank's garden because <clears throat> this is a statue of St. Francis of Assisi who was known to love birds and nature. <clears throat> Uh, it changes over the years because of a variety of different conditions, but I'll share with you as I go. So you can garden in a box, you can garden in your sock, you can garden here or there, you can garden anywhere. And that is the key uh, statement for container, gar container gardening because you truly can garden anywhere if you want to garden in containers. So what we're going to talk about briefly today in each of these areas is the advantages of container gardening. We'll talk about selection and preparation, getting, getting your containers ready to go. Where are you going to put them? The location, the plant selection, potting soil, and then I will go over some planting basics. And I know that all of these things are really uh, very familiar to you all. But I think as we go through, we all find every time we watch something like this, we might pick up one or two hints as we leave our Zoom meetings and our, our presentations. So why do we garden in containers? Well, for me, one of the big things is they can be your garden. I have a very large garden. I am getting, how do I put this, more mature. Okay, and I think that, you know, that hopefully that happens with all of us. And as that happens, it's harder to get down on our knees, and then it's even harder to get back up. So it's really helpful when you garden in containers because you can sit in a chair, have your container right next to you, and, uh, and garden away without uh, killing yourself or your back or whatever. So uh, the other thing is the portability of containers. I think that my garden is a lot like my living room. I don't like everything in the same place all the time. So if I garden in containers, I can move stuff around and kind of mix things up and, and have things a little more aesthetically pleasing. And then if I don't like it, just like my furniture, I'll move it back. So gardens can just be your garden. Containers can just be your garden. These pictures, and this picture on the left is from a friend who's very, very clever, and you'll see more of her thing. These are, these are pictures of my garden a couple of years ago when, again, I made a little grouping on the corner of my patty. Or you can incorporate these things into your landscape. As you see here, this is a bed that's next to a swimming pool, and there's a number of, of garden pots that are there, and you can plant almost anything in them. <clears throat> Again, this is that bed that I showed you earlier, and you can see how it's changed over the years. This is Frank's bed. This is a little raised bed right outside my kitchen window, and it's my herb garden. <clears throat> so when I'm ready for the kitchen, I can just run outside and stick my herbs. And then this is my pride and joy. This is what kind of got me started with teaching container garden. That is a cast iron bathtub that I bought at a garage sale for $25. It is extremely heavy. I filled it with rocks in the bottom and uh, put down some garden cloth and then put the soil in it. And like my other gardens, it changes frequently as depending on what I plant in it. And it's also 
really cool because it's a focal point for my garden. The portability of garden, con, uh, container gardening is great for small patios and balconies. I'm sure at one time or another, we've all lived in those situations and may now, maybe we don't have a lot of yard or a lot of, a lot of large patio areas. So you can still have your, your garden right on the back patio or the balcony of your apartment complex. Imagination spawns creativity. As I mentioned, this is the garden for a friend of mine. <clears throat> and actually it's other side, it's, it's two sides of the same garden. And she's very clever. She's, uh, I regrettably <clears throat> gave her this chair because that was going to go in the junkyard, right? And she took it and stapled some chicken wire in there, put down some mulch and, and some soil and turned it into a tiny little container garden full of succulents. And you can see she has all sorts of neat little things hanging. This parasol, for instance, it really serves a dual purpose. This is a west-facing wall. And we all know how hot the sun gets in the West, uh, uh, like at four o'clock in the afternoon. So this provided protection for her containers as well. <clears throat> containers come in all shapes and sizes. The raised beds, the raised beds that Iscarity and, and in AgriLife Gardens are, are actually containers if you want to get down to it. You can take all of your uh, different sizes of pots and you can see I've got them interspersed here throughout uh, throughout one of my beds. I put them on bricks, I use plant stands, just a variety of things. And then I'm also a great one for yard art. So I this is the cat that guards this particular garden. And she's been there for years. So you can have raised beds, you can have pots and beds. You can have giant pots, uh, which of course, depending on what you're going to plant, and you can plant almost anything in a container. Uh, I'm not real crazy about planting trees in them, but I've seen it done before. If they wouldn't got to get as big as they would, as if you were uh, as if you were in the um, uh, the yard, you had them planted in the soil. But you can see that there's a variety of things. This is a fun little situation, and it's created by putting a piece of you can use a piece of rebar that has like a sand on the bottom, and take your pots and go right through the drainage holes, and then. Uh, tip your pots and plant them accordingly. It gives a, a really cool aesthetic value. This is another thing in my yard that comes and goes and gets treated in different ways all the time because I get tired of it or maybe I lose a plant. And remember, anything that dies is an opportunity. <laughs> Don't worry about that so much. <clears throat> so there's all sorts of opportunities there. It's really fun to do creative groupings. Of course, this is my friend that has that creative gene. I don't necessarily have it, but I'm very good at borrowing other people's ideas. So she's got her hummingbird hanger up here uh, with, a, with a shepherd's hook and a little bit of yard art. She's used an old bench and she's just set the pots there with all sorts of containers all the way around. And uh, it, it just really makes uh, a neat appearance in her yard. Uh, also, you can see that she's used a number of different kinds of shapes of containers. You can put containers in containers and make little stacks. You know, it just kind of depends on what you're adding to your imagination will let you do. So don't hesitate to try that. And of course, this pot on the right is a beautiful splash of color with a variety of plants in it. And whimsy to me is so much fun. Again, my creative friends cause this. <clears throat> she has three or four of them in her yard now. And those are kind of the gates to nowhere. So she has a wood slat fence that's put up in front of her rock wall. And she's just painted that gate on there. I actually bought uh, a couple of old uh, handles, you know, for pulling, put some hinges on there. And the gate goes nowhere. But it adds that, you know, and she's got a little walkway going up. And of course, she's got, here's an example of, a, I believe she's got a crepe myrtle in there in that pot plus other things that are sitting around. This is an old picture frame, y'all. I would have thrown it in the trash. Oh, and not my friend Susan. She turned it into a container. And this is an old garden cart. And again, she made a lovely little succulent garden out of a little tiny succulents. So she truly used her imagination. And she reclaimed some old treasures. So, <clears throat> what kind of containers, what container material should we use? Well, you're going to find 
a plethora of, of things that are available everywhere. Plastic pots, wire baskets, clay pots, terracotta, whiskey barrels, lid tubs, all of these. You can you can read all of these on the on the PowerPoint. Uh, and and they all work really well. I always thought this was really cool. In 2011, when we had that terrible freeze, and a lot of people lost palm trees. Well, it's also very cost prohibitive to have those taken out. So many people cut them off, and you can hollow them out and make a container out of them. And you know, plant something in your parkway that you would not have had. You would have had just an ugly old stump sitting there otherwise. <clears throat> Galvanized tubs. And as we know, we don't have a rowboat out in Asteri, but we certainly have a canoe. And it is, it is one of the focal points of the garden and very much uh, very useful because it is a large container. And so here's some examples of things and the kind of stuff that you can put in it. This ceramic pot is full of squash. So you can even do your vegetables. There's a whole other presentation on planting vegetables in containers. The key to that is having a very large container that makes it huge, especially if you're planting your tomatoes. Now, this is an example of something that we have on our website, <clears throat> and it is a self-watering pot. And on our website, you can find the directions for how to make that. And it works beautifully because if you're a traveler, like many of us are at this point in the game, you can uh, you can use the self-watering pot, fill it up, and go away for two or three days without having to bother the neighbor. And then these are just some examples of clay and terracotta and plastic pots that, as I said, sit under my, my window, and I use it mostly for a an herb garden. And of course, then you have to add your grandchildren's uh, art to it so that they always know what you're thinking about. So here's some suggestions for cake pie and succulents. Um, I love the one on the top left. This is a, a picture that I borrowed from a lady by the name of Deborah Baldwin. She is a, a succulent guru and expert. And this is a bird bath and it's filled with different kinds of ionians. And as you can see, uh, there, there's soil, of course, in there with drainage in the bird bath. But then she topped it off with a mulch of blue marbles, blue and green marbles. So it gives the illusion of water. Okay. Many of these other pictures are pictures that uh, that uh, Jim Hastings had shared with us over the years, and you can just see they're very unique. The the different kinds of cacti and succulents that are there, and there's that old chair that I silly me that I gave away, but isn't that a fun idea for for uh, planting just a little tiny, even like almost a fairy garden type situation in that in the bottom of that chair, and an example of some stack pots as well. So you can do that with your containers. And don't forget flowers. I think we all love flowers and we love the color. I, uh, those of you that know me well know that I'm a succulent uh, fanatic, I guess is the word. But I also love bright colors. This was a, this was a fun pot that actually uh, was a bit of an accident. I sent my husband to the garden shop one day for some, uh, for some pansies. And he heard the pee and came home with a whole bucket load of petunias. And so I very kindly said, thank you very much. And I planted them and it was one of the most beautiful pots I've ever had in my life. It just, it was like the Energizer Bunny. It just gave and gave. This is some geraniums. We saw this picture earlier. The cat is guarding the, that garden. And if I had the whole picture, you'd see my bathtub that's on the right. My bathtub will stay there forever. I told him if I die, he's welcome to cremate me and just sprinkle my ashes over the over that bathtub because it would be really good compost. So <laughs> not to worry. And I think this is really fun too. We just, you know, how many of us have an old wheelbarrow laying around it? Probably needs to be sanded down or maybe it doesn't work anymore or whatever, but look how cleverly they've painted that. And then they filled it with red and white geraniums and then daffodils. It's almost time to plant those to get them ready for spring. And this, I think, is a hoot. If you look very closely, there is a lady who lives in this huge high rise. This picture was out of Chicago. And look what she has planted all of her vegetables in, her tomatoes. There's a trash can, there's bins, so forth and so on. I think this is a hoot. And then if you look closely, there she is peeking out from behind her potato, from, from behind her tomato. This is a great way to store your veggies. We don't think about that because we have all of these wide open spaces here. 
but it's just something that's good to know. Let's talk a little bit about location. As I mentioned earlier, containers can really create a focal point in your yard. You want to provide afternoon shade when possible. Full sun in El Paso is very different from full sun in Bangor, Maine. But what does the tag say? It says full sun, and then that truck goes from California to put across the nation. So light, there's full sunlight, shade, and what we call dappled sunlight, which is shade that comes down through, through a tree. Your container basics, you want to use sizable containers. Seven, seven gallons usually is a pretty good size. Um, light colored containers reduce heat. Uh, the, terracotta, the terracotta containers, number one, are quite heavy. I never throw them out until they give up the ghost and die. But um, when I replace them, I always try to replace with something lighter. And then, of course, as everybody knows, and this is probably the key thing I'm with you again today, so, as I said, um, sizable containers, the lighter ones reduce the heat. That's why a school bus has a white, has a white roof. Uh, the terracotta retains the heat, drainage, select your appropriate soil for what you're going to plant. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Add a balanced, dry, time-release granular, uh, granular fertilizer to your dry potting medium. And we're going to go through some of these steps one at a time. And then another great thing to do is to add dish soap to water. Now, I've been accused and called a, a Lucille Ball, I guess because of my red hair, but also because I do silly things. One time I put a whole teaspoon of soap in a gallon of water. I don't know if you remember the Lucille Ball uh, video <laughs> with the soap coming in. Well, that was me. Just a tiny drop of a dish soap acts as a surfactant. I remember hearing that term, and I thought, I'm not raising my hand and admitting that I don't know what that means. So I looked it up, and, and what it actually does is surfactant makes the water wetter, which is kind of silly, too, but it really works, and it helps to disperse the water throughout your soil when you add it <clears throat> and give you a uh, give your plants a better start. And of course, then you want to loosely add your potting soil until it's level with the top of the pot. Now, I'm going to ask my man of white, Mr. Art Corral, to come up. And we're going to show you, because Art is the greatest conservationist in all of the world. And he knows every garden hack. We're going to do a presentation on that one of these days, right, Art? Right. That's, that's known to mankind. But many times we want to put something in a very large pot. And you thought, well, I don't want to take out a small business loan to go buy potting soil. So Art has developed this wonderful method of conserving soil in large pots. And we're going to, it's on the, on the PowerPoint, but he's going to show it to you. You're going to start with a large empty container. This is a probably a, this was a five gallon. This is a five gallon container. Can you see it? And then there's a number of things you can do. You can displace the soil and use up some of that, um, that turf or that, that real estate, if you will, in the pot that you really don't need for soil for your clients because they don't have a, a need for a real deep, for real deep roots. Now, if you were doing a tomato, I wouldn't put anything in there but soil because it's, it has long, far-reaching roots, but if you're going to do this decoratively, then you could use plastic water bottles. You can use packing peanuts. Uh, aluminum cans have worked. And then Art has also come up with this opportunity as well to um, use one of those salad cartons that you get at the grocery store when you buy ready-made salad. So go up close, Art, and show folks what, you, what you've done. The, what he's showing you right now is actually the middle, is the middle uh, picture. And then if he takes that out, okay, what he's done with the, with the salad thing is to put, he's put drainage holes in there. Put it, okay. Put it so, down more. Down more. I mean, can y'all see it? You can't see in it. How's that? that way? Can you I see? Bring it to the okay. <laughs> We're technologically challenged here, y'all. Won't it be nice when we can all just be back together again? There. So yeah. you can see he's filled that pot with water bottles. So and pill bottles. Huh? And what? And pill bottles. And pill bottles, and a little bit on. of everything. Do you keep the lids Are the lids on there, Art? Yes. They are. Okay. All right. And then you can, to keep the soil from draining through between those bottles, you can take a, a piece of a, a screen 
uh, and put it on there, right? And that will make that you put the soil. Or, like Jan said, I just happened to find an exact fit for this pot, which is a salad uh, container. And I just drilled some holes in it so, so you can see the holes mm -hmm. against Jan's white shirt. <laughs> and it fits perfectly in there. Let me, let me get this situated here. But you can see it has the perfect fit right there. Now, what Jan is talking about is certain plants that, you know, you've got the huge pots like she has on her displays, and you certainly don't want to use all that soil. For example, if you're planting some herbs or some ornamental plants, they only need about anywhere from 8 to 12 inches worth of soil for their particular type of rooting uh, roots that they have. Now, if it, if it was a tomato plant or a tree, you would certainly not put anything because then they can use the rest of that pot to send their roots down. But for herbs and ornamentals or, or even succulents, they have a very shallow root ball so if this is all you need as far as soil, and that's exactly where this tray comes in. And so you're saving yourself that much more soil of just being wasted soil. And like Jan says, these are portable pots. You're going to want to shift them around. And who has to move them? You do. So this is one way of making your pots lighter and saving money, but not by not using that much soil. Okay. Okay, thank you, Art. That really is a good tip. And these are things that, in working together, with, that we've come up with over, over the years. Okay, I've been talking about drainage, and I know you all know the importance of this. And so here again, we've, I've demonstrated in these pictures uh, some, the different kinds of things. Lots of times you'll get a pot that you really like, and it doesn't have drainage holes in it, and it's frustrating. There's two things you can do. You can use that as a what we call a cash pot, C-A-C-H-E, and say you had a great big beautiful decorative pot, and this might fit right in it. Well, you can plant in here and then drop this into that cash pot, and you have the aesthetic value of the outside, but the plant's going to just be as happy as a pig in a poke, if it's, as long as it's got the soil and water and fertilizer that it needs. But... Another thing that you can do is you can purchase what's called a spade bit. And I always remember because it looks just like a shovel. Okay. And in this case, I have done this particular pot. Can you, can you see it? Yes. Okay. And I drilled all these holes with my spade bit. Now, lots of times you'll get pots that you will buy. that just have one drainage hole. Often I like to add, uh, I like to add mm -hmm. from here, I'll pass this around for those of you that are in classes, and you can see how we accomplish that. And my latest discovery, and I just love this, is to create, I know, well, let me back up a minute. My mother, I said, put pottery shards in the bottom of your pot. Not necessary. That's kind of an old wives' tale, actually. And I didn't always have pottery shards and so forth and so on. But I did want to promote good drainage. And I also wanted to get, you know, critters out of my containers. These pots are just perfect for these little tiny bugs. But if you buy yourself a roll of this wonderful stuff at the big box store, it's screening material. It's very lightweight. And unlike a window screen, it doesn't assassinate you. You don't come away wounded and bleeding when you go to cut it. It's very soft and pliable and easy to use. I bought this for about 10 bucks, probably three years ago, and I'm still using it for my box. And, and for what I did in the case of this particular one is I cut just a round piece of this screening and it fits and that's just a picture of that. And then I just lay it in there and it fits very nicely. So then I'm ready to uh, plant my crop. So any and all plants are suitable for containers. Uh, don't be hesitant about that. The only exception that I would say is trees. But I've also seen a vitex tree and art grafted uh, crepe myrtle for me that's gorgeous. And it's in a huge ceramic pot. 
And I have no doubt that she's going to live for a long time. So there's exceptions to all the rules. So, again, remember, these are some basics that you all know. Your annuals complete their life cycle in one season, okay? Your biannuals complete its life cycle in two seasons. Parsley is an example of a biannual. But don't cut it back. Leave it out there so the swallowtails can lay their larvae on there. And we have all sorts of new butterflies. And then perennials are plants that live for more than two years. In this neck of the woods, what we call annuals are frequently perennials or semi-perennials. They're going to last more than one year because our climate is so mild. So what we I plant here in El Paso in the winter would, would winter over just fine. But in the cold, cold parts of the Northeast and the, the Midwest and stuff, it's, gonna, it's not going to be the case. So we know that pot mates all need the same light, the same water, and the same fertilizer. Okay? Because compatibility counts. We want everybody to be happy in the same room. No arguing. <laughs> okay. We also talk about, uh, and I'll this information to Linda Kipe, our longest sitting master gardener. She's the one that taught me all about container gardening. And you've all seen her mostly for your container gardening class when you, when you took the master gardener class. And she always said, don't just plant one little thing in a pot. They're lonesome. They lonesome. And, and when, when they're in there together, they're fighting for the nutrients and, and so there's a riot going on under the ground and it forces them to be healthier. So you want what we call a thrill, a fill, and a spill. Now, you might plant this, and here we have a fern, and we have some petunias, and we have a little sage, and it's just lovely, but maybe it just sits there. And you think, man, I'm going to pull it. This thing's gone. It's not doing anything. Another really great little uh, quip to keep in the back of your mind, a little poem. The first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. And it really is the case. And if you go out and peruse your garden, I think you will find some instances of that. So don't, don't get panicky. Now, if something's obviously crumpled over and dry as a bone and everything, then it's time to pull it and say, I am narrow. And like I said, anything that dies is an opportunity. I have a three strike, strike rule. If, if you die three times, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Foliage. Foliage in and of itself creates a beautiful container. This is, this is, this is coleus, this is the more coleus. All of these are succulents, uh, different types of sedum. This is the ghost plant. And look how pretty this coleus is with just with some fern that's hanging out of the pot. So when we talk about the thrill, the fill, and the spill, the thrill is your anchor plant. In this case, it's the coleus, okay? This one does not necessarily have a fill, but it definitely has a spill in there, in that container. And you can see if I go back to this last slide, this has all three. This is your thrill, this is your fill, and this is your spill, okay? And flowers, don't we love them? Mm -hmm. Pinstamons and cactus, cactus flowers and uh, Flocks, all sorts of wonderful things. So, and these are things that our desert produces that most people don't realize how blessed we are to have those. So, selecting container grown plants is this really, really, really important, as you all know. When you go to the big box stores or your nurseries, be vigilant about what you're looking at. Don't necessarily to trust all of the tags that are in there. I think there's people that go around and move tags just because they think it's funny, I guess. But you want to look for good signs. Make sure that they've got clear labeling and that if there's one plant like that that has a particular label and six others that have a different label, guess what? The one you're looking at is probably wrong. That's when you ask for help or, or you all will know enough because you're master gardeners and you'll recognize which is which. Uh, small green weeds, don't panic about those. That signals good growth. And then small roots that are peeping out through the container, that's okay too. But it's getting ready to tell you, hey, mama, I went out of this pot into a bigger one. Your bad signs are wilted leaves, pests or disease and dense weeds, uh, a split container because thick roots are growing it through the base. You do not want to bring home hitchhikers. 
And where do hitchhikers hang out? Where they cannot be seen. So don't hesitate. Pull that plant up. Look at it. Look underneath and make sure that it's free of uh, all of those kinds of things. So this picture just shows you what do you, you see the good signs versus the bad. And, and when you see a plant like this, y'all, it's, it's on its way out. So uh, unless you're just really brave and you're at one of the big box stores and they've got plants for 50 cents, something like that, I would leave that in the nursery. They should pull those actually. So it's time to plant. Again, I go back to the basics that Linda has taught all of us over the years. And I think that these things are so important to help to guarantee your success. When you get your plants home, uh, and it doesn't matter what you use, you can use a cake pan or a galvanized tub or whatever, and set those plants in, in some water, maybe an inch or two of water, so that that water can wick up into those root balls. And I'll explain why in a minute. You're gonna remove the plant, and I'll talk again about how you need to make sure and do that. You're gonna tease or cut the roots. I was wondering why mom was always doing this with her plants. Well, she was loosening up those roots so that when it got into its new home, its roots could go out, because what did those roots do? Everything, they, they bring in nutrients, they bring in the water, so, and all of that. So that's the riot that's going on under the soil. You're gonna put the plant in a, in a planting hole, I'll talk about that, backfill in firm, and then water to remove your air pockets, and then if you'd like, very helpful in our deck of the woods to add mulch. So here's a picture of preparing the plant for planting. As you can see here, it's being soaked, and I usually do it about 30 minutes before I'm ready to actually plant my plants. It, 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 and again, depending on how wet that, that plant might be when you bring it home from the garden, uh, from the nursery rather, it may be pretty wet already. And then when you take it out, and I don't think I need to say this, but I'm going to anyway, just to remind, never do this. Don't ever do this, okay? I've, this is my little crop. You're going to put your, your middle and your index finger around the base, <clears throat> the root of the, of the plant where it comes from the soil. Tap it gently, or if you're using those two inch, the six packs where you get six plants in a little two inch, a plastic fork is a wonderful thing to gently go down the sides and lift that plant out of that tub. six pack. And you all know, those six packs are a good way to save money because the same plant might be sitting next to it in a four inch pot for $4, where a six pack might be $1.88. And you would be surprised at how quickly they will grow. So that's something I try to do as well. And then this is a picture of teasing or cutting the roots. Um, a steak knife in your garden tools is a great thing to have because you can score down the sides or the bottom of the plant to uh, help tease those roots and get them out. Okay, and then the plant hole is somewhat larger in, direct, in diameter than the root ball, okay? So you're gonna have enough room to get that baby snuggled in there. And then as a rule, a general rule, you're going to plant uh, flat with, with where the soil level is. Now, an exception to that rule would be tomatoes. Just like in the garden, we plant them about, about two thirds of the way down. So you would wanna do the same thing and get that that hole dug really deeply. But as a rule, your, your hole is gonna be the depth of the root ball. <clears throat> okay, and then you're gonna refill the hole with soil, firm the soil around it really well, uh, around the stem and the roots. And of course, this is gonna to help to eliminate the air pockets and, and get those out. As the water soaks in, it will help settle the soil. Now, I mentioned earlier about soaking the, soaking the little plant. You go, well, why would I do that? What you're doing is you're putting a wet root ball into wet soil. Because remember, and I, I should have backed up and mentioned this again earlier. When, we, when I told you to put the soap in the water, you're going to always moisten that potting soil. Always moisten the potting soil first. So then you're putting a moist wet ball, excuse me, a moist root ball into moist soil. So it has a good start. Because if you put a dry root ball into the, into the wet soil, when you go to water, it's just gonna run off and you're gonna lose plants. And we all know how important it is at first for them to get a good start 
then with the exception of succulents, you're going to want to water those a little bit every day. It's just like in the kitchen. Once you get it in there, you can't take it out. So be very judicious about how much you water. And then you can add the mulch around. You can do a sphagnum moss, even the red bark mulch, those kinds of things, whatever you want. With my succulents, I use rocks. I buy them at the dollar store for a dollar a bag. They're very aesthetically pleasing, <clears throat> and it helps. Remember, mulch is very important to keep the moisture in and the weeds out. And that's another real advantage to your containers. You don't have near the weeds that you do in your um, especially if it's the summer of 2021 and we have 800 inches of rain. So that's a, another benefit of the container garden. So <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to back up a minute and talk about is your soil, okay? Be sure to buy the right soil. Be sure to buy the right soil for the right plant. Avoid garden soil. Very heavy. It has a lot of sand. It makes it impossible to cart your, your containers around. And it, it's not that great for the plants. So get a good, a good potting soil is what I recommend. You can make your own. There's different recipes on the internet. I'm too lazy. My time is worth money. So I go and we all have our favorite ones. You know, there's miracle Grow out there. There's Black Gold. There's Fertilone. And then some of the off brands that maybe the stores name on their own. But make sure that it's that it's nice and has a nice texture to it and that it has quite a bit of perlite in it because that perlite incorporates air into the soil and that's very vital for the plants. So we've we've got them in now. We've you know we've moistened our, our potting soil, we've moistened our root ball, we've put more than one plant in a pot so that they're in there, all they're in there fighting under the, underneath the ground for, the, for those nutrients, which will promote more growth and more, uh, more flowers as well if you're working with your ornamentals. So now we've got to take care of them. Fertilizer, <clears throat> we all know what the three big numbers are. The three biggies are potassium, nitro, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Proper watering, 90% of our problems you all that we have in our gardens are caused by water. And I think I'm very safe in saying that more plants die from overwatering than underwatering. Okay. When I talk to people, uh, there aren't master gardeners. That's the first question that comes up. And nine times out of ten, that's what's happened. They have drowned that plant and the root ball has rotted. Because what happens? They look at the top of the container, oh, it's dry. Not necessarily. I'll show you that in a minute. Good air circulation, of course, is important. And that's another reason that that perlite in your potting soil is important because it, <clears throat> it helps with that. So the mystery numbers, and I mentioned about using a granulated uh, fertilizer to put into the dry potting soil before you get started. A 10-10-10 or a 15-15-15 really, really help. And remember, your nitrogen is what makes your plants green. Your phosphorus is what gives you your flowers and your fruit, and your potassium gives you healthy roots. And this is right up there with drainage. Follow the package instructions, okay? Less, I mean, to you, more is not better. The directions are there for a reason, so read them carefully and follow them explicitly. So, proper watering. <clears throat> As I said, don't overwater. <clears throat> Don't let pots stand in water. That does a couple of things. When they stand in water, the water has the ability to whip up through that container and uh, it's, it's going to rot the roots if it's standing there. And the other thing, especially this time of the year, you're going to attract mosquitoes. So be really careful about not letting water stand in your, stand in your uh, saucers that you have under your plants. And then when you water, uh, well, first of all, don't let the plant stress for lack of water either. So water until water comes out the bottom, okay? This will keep you from having to water so very often. People will tell me, I water three times a day. And I'm going, holy cow, no wonder your plants are dead. Okay, because 99.9% .9 sure that those root balls are soaking wet, even though it may appear to be dry. So this is an inexpensive yet effective water gauge. Oh, and I thought I added these pictures. A couple of other things that you can do. Water meters are great. They're not expensive. 
I bought a couple the other day for 12 bucks on Amazon. But one of the best ones of all is this little thing right here. <laughs> a number two pencil, okay? A shiny number two pencil. Or you can use a chopstick or a dowel. But I like the shiny pencil because you're going to put the pencil right into the pot and you're going to pull it out. And if there's soil that's sticking on the pencil, that indicates that there's plenty of moisture going on down there in that pot. If you pull it out and there's nothing, then your plant is telling you, I need some water. And I also go around the pot. I don't just put it in one place. I check different sizes. And I do that with a water meter too. But this one's pretty much free. But uh, if you use your dowel or you use a, a chopstick, it's going to get stained. And it's a little harder to tell whether you're, whether you're bringing up a stained chopstick or that there's actually soil around it. But that's a, a really good thing, a uh, good trick to use. <clears throat> Air circulation is very important. Just like us, we need three things. We need nutrients, we need water, and we need air, okay? Now, <clears throat> when I was talking about overwatering, things get anaerobic, and then the air does not circulate. And that's when you get that stinky, nasty smell and everything else. So be very careful about that. Elevate your pots above the floor and above the water in the catch basin. And it may mean that you're going to have to, to empty those saucers frequently. And that's just great mosquito control. You, you, know, you want to avoid those pests. Bricks and rocks and plant stands are great for elevating. And uh, even when I have a plant stand, I'll put a saucer underneath. Because if I have, happen to have a plant underneath that plant, then I'm watering that uh, second plant twice, and I don't want to do that. So, your tool care and maintenance. I think this is a picture of Ignacio out in the garden. What do you think? <laughs> Except the nose is a little big. He's got a very nice smoke. So, anyway, we'll call this Ignacio, okay? There he is with his shovel, and he's out in the Asperity Garden, digging and everything. But when he's done, you want to make sure that you get your tools clean. I think this is something we all get very lax about. I know I do. In our gardens, both at uh, AgriLife and I'm sure at the Rose Garden as well, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, we have a container of bleach water. One part alcohol or bleach to nine parts water. Or you can use those disinfecting, uh, disinfecting wipes. When I am working on my roses at home, uh, I use those in the garden and after each bush that I prune, I wipe off my blades with those disinfecting wipes. And we all know they're everywhere right now because of COVID. So they're easy to get a hold of. But that's a great way to, uh, to keep your pruners really good and clean. And then make sure that you sharpen them. Uh, sharpen your pruners, your knives, and your scissors on a regular basis. You can buy a little honing tool uh, when you buy your spade bit that I talked about earlier. And just keep that in your cache of, of, uh, of garden tools. And, uh, and sharpen those. I remember Patrick O'Brien teaching us how to do that. You never do this, but then you just go down one way and make sure that that blade is good and sharp, okay? And then oil these to prevent rusting. Oil these to prevent rusting. And it's, it's really easy to say, oh gosh, I've gardened all day, I'm tired, I'm not gonna mess with it right now. But if you get in the habit, it really makes a difference as far as how long your, your tools will last. How am I doing with time? Because I'm finished. <laughs> I, didn't, I, wanted to, I wanted to leave enough time for questions. Um, this is basically a presentation that they give at the El Paso Community College uh, with Enrique Pettis and all of those fine folks that, that teach there. So I wanted to revise it a little bit because you all are very knowledgeable about much of this stuff, but I hope there's at least a couple of things that maybe... Um, I was able to share today that would make things easier for you. So, uh, uh, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy. George, you got one? Yes. Uh, that screen, where'd you see you bought that? I bought this at one of the big box stores. Oh, we need to repeat, box we need to repeat the question. Repeat question. Repeat. Okay. question. The question was, where did I get the screening, this good stuff? And I'm going to pass it back here. I got it at, uh, I don't know, and I've got them all over the place. If I got a little bit of pots, I got great new pots. Yeah. And I believe I paid ten dollars. You need to repeat. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys know I can't stand still. <clears throat> um, 
I've, ha I've had it for about two years, between two and three years, and I think I paid $10 for it. Now, if you've got leftover screens at home, don't hesitate. You can use those. But this doesn't rust, and it also does not tear up my hands. <laughs> so it's very pliable. Here's, here's a little bitty piece, if y'all can see this. And I use a little, a little uh, smaller, smaller pots that I put succulents in. And this is great because succulents in particular, remember their leaves are full of water. That's why they're called succulents. So there you're going to water them much less often as a rule than you do your regular plants. When you start your containers, <coughs> give, give them a little bit of water every day for the first two weeks. Okay? And then after that, you can start to back off depending on the weather. And you, that's where the little moisture meter or the magic pencil or the dowel come in very, very handy. And don't forget, your fingers are great water gauge. Tell me, Lindbergh wants to know, can you use coffee filters? Yes, you can. I've used coffee question. before I discovered the screening. The question. Oh, the, the question is, can you use coffee filters in place of the screening? And the answer is absolutely. Now, they're biodegradable, so eventually they're going to go bye-bye. <laughs> but it does work and it helps because the water can permeate that, uh, the coffee filter. I usually put them uh, at least too thick, if you know, two, two layers. And, and they're nice because they fit right down in many of our, of our smaller pots. So that's, that's really a helpful thing. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, Rosie wants to know, whoops. Uh, sometimes it is hard to find balanced fertilizers. Any recommendations for substitutes when this happens? Hmm. I've not had that much of a problem with it. Most of the back, big stores will carry different varieties. Um, I, For me, with fertilizers, once I get things started, I, and I like the, the balanced one. I know Art uses a balanced one. I think he gets it at Walmart. Right, 10, 10, 10. 10, 10, 10. I use the 14, 14, 14. So ask the people at the store what kind of, you know, where are their fertilizers and look at those three numbers. Mm -hmm. Because when you're getting started, then you have equal amounts of nitrogen, potassium, and, uh, and phosphorus in there. Now, all else fails, go to Lambasol. Yeah, that's true. That's a good idea, Ignacio. He said, if all, if all else fails, go to Amazon. And I know we're not supposed to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not touting Remote. any one uh, particular uh, type or brand. Osmocote usually can be found almost everywhere. What is the brand that you use, Art? Uh, I just use the tint, tint, tint from Walmart. But it's just a Walmart brand, yeah. right? So a generic brand will work. Now, when you go to do your fertilizers for your, your plant maintenance, I always use a water soluble. I know that the time release say that they're gonna last for four or five months. Not too much, I don't think. So I do a supplement with a granular fertilizer and I like the one that has the higher number in the middle because that's the phosphorus and that gives me more blooms. You know, by that time, I'm assuming that the time release has given my, my, my roots and the, and the green leaves a good start. So I'm going to add a fertilizer that has a little more, a little more phosphorus. In. Now, if you have, if you have like ferns, for instance, you know, some of them bloom, they get a little tiny white blossom on them, but you can use a higher nitrogen fire uh, fertilizer for those if you would like. So it just kind of, you, you know, it's just like everything else. It depends on what you're planting and what you're working with. If you're fertilizing your succulents, the general thought on that is to fertilize them once in the spring and once in the winter, and you cut your fertilizer in half. Okay. And lots of times I even forget to fertilize. They they're wonderful things because they just care for themselves and they really are quite beautiful. Patsy Sanders wants to know what potting soil do you prefer? <laughs> I'm not a mass gardener right now. I love Fertilone. I love the Fertilone products. You can't get them everywhere. And I love black gold. I love black gold. Now, when you talk about soils, I don't like the potting soils that have all the stuff in them. I will fertilize myself because my succulents might need different 
fertilizer than my ornamental plants. And I also uh, frequently, because I do love my succulents so much, I use uh, a cactus soil. And I, to be honest with you, I've only seen two brands, and one is uh, one is Black Gold, and one is uh, Miracle Grow. Okay, and I know that's been the gold standard. So if that's what you want, that's great. And there's many of them. Uh, stumbled on one last week actually at Walmart, and it's a a no name. I guess it's one of theirs. And I bought it for my sister, <clears throat> and I was helping her with some plants. And it was a beautiful soil. It had lots of perlite in it. Real soft and, and uh, you know had had enough peat moss and all that. But you don't want too much peat moss either. So it's pretty much a personal preference, but uh, that's my favorite. And it's not available everywhere. Not available at the big box stores. Okay, anything else? That's all here on the chat okay. box. All right. Anybody else here? Any other questions from our? Container that you make the holesmith. Yes. Gadget. Oh, the spade bit? Yes. That's George a, wants to see the spade bit. That's it's, a diamond tear bit. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I paid probably 12 bucks for it, and I used it and used it and used it. So you can, you can use a masonry bit. Yeah, masonry yeah. will get, will, will that, work as well. That's a diamond bit, and it'll cut through everything. I thought it was something special that she created her. No, I, I do not. Uh, uh, like I said, I'm great at stealing ideas from others. I don't create those kinds of but things. The yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's, you know, there's many ways to skin the cat. So whatever works for y'all, but make sure you've got that drainage. Don't, don't eliminate, that, eliminate that at all. I thank you very much for putting up with me and listening to me. I hope somebody was helpful. And I'll see you in the garden.